Okay, well, here we go. Let's get focused. I, I will uh, just uh, say first off, uh, this message has nothing to do with Mother's Day. So, <laughs> so you had the video, and, and uh, I, I really am praying that the Lord uses this in your life this morning. Um, I w it was, it's been a while since I've been up here speaking. Uh, anybody maybe watching, they're like, what happened to her hair? She, d she looks different. So it's been that long. Uh, probably the last time I spoke, my hair was actually black. <laughs> but um, I, I would say probably over a year ago, I really felt the Lord speaking something to me. And so when my husband asked, would you like to speak for Mother's Day, I, I knew immediately kind of the subject matter, but really needed to pray on it and, and uh, explore it a little bit more. And um, I really felt like God was, was saying to me, Sue, have you lost some of your wonder? Have you lost some of your appreciation. And so first, to start this message, I'm going to take you on a little tour with me uh, because I got thinking, first of all, you can go to the next slide. Let's define what wonder means because it can be a noun, it can be a verb, right? Uh, this, this, is, this is the definition that we're going with today. Wonder, a cause of astonishment or admiration the quality of exciting admiration, rapt attention or astonishment at something awesomely mysterious or new to one's experience. So I want you to keep this definition in mind through the message this morning. Um, if I was to title this message, I would entitle it, May You Never Lose Your Wonder. So. We're going to go on a little personal tour with Sue because I, I thought about the things that um, I would say I have wonder at. I have that rapt attention. Um, so the first slide. This is a picture I took when my husband and I went to the Grand Canyon. And I don't know if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, but... Uh, I can't describe it any other way standing there than utter wonderment that this beautiful creation and how big it is. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Just so I, okay, so you know what I'm talking about? Like you just stand there and, and you think your eyes deceive you a little bit, but, but uh, just God's creation and how it's made and all the, all the different like lines of, of uh, the soil and the rock and the, I just stand there in wonderment. So this is my personal wonder list. Okay, second slide, or next slide. Not a great picture of Niagara Falls, but, but uh, Niagara Falls, I've been there many times because I grew up in Canada. I don't know if you've ever been there, but you can just stand there and it is amazing. Now, the time this picture, I took this picture, it was winter and it was an especially cold winter and so a lot of the falls was frozen actually. And even that uh, rapt attention is definitely something I would describe I had when I stood there. Okay, next slide. Okay, a little fuzzy. But I don't know you moms, okay, this is probably the only time I'll tie it in, but you moms, do you remember the first time that you saw an ultrasound picture of your baby? Um, I would like to introduce to you our new granddaughter who is due in October. This is her. <laughs> yeah, our daughter Jessica is expecting her second baby. But um, yeah, this, I mean... how easy it is to just take this for granted. God's word says that he knits us together in our mother's wombs, that he is taking this child, and this is like her first ultrasound, so this is a very young ultrasound photo, but even to compare it to the next one that she had, and you see the change, you can see it. Now, I know some of you might think I can't make heads or tails out of that, but, but um, 
I think sometimes even how we can just look at that and just think, oh yeah, ultrasound picture. But to have that wonder that God is taking the cells and that the heartbeat is there and that that is a life, that is a life created in his image. And we should wonder at it, you know, we should. And even once that child comes out into this world and is in its terrible twos, to still have that wonder, right? Because it is a miracle. Life is a miracle. And lastly, I, the last picture slide, do you know what these are? They're fireflies. It's a picture of fireflies. Okay, it's not the Grand Canyon, and it's not Niagara Falls. But I'll tell you, when I sit at our camper in the quiet, away from the technology, away from the noise, by the campfire, and the summer night sky lights up with fireflies, I can sit in wonder, in wonderment. I, I, I think it's just amazing. I love fireflies. It's just one of the things that just causes me a lot of joy. And, you know, this is my little tour. You can probably think in your own minds of things that you've experienced or seen that, that maybe you wonder at. Not wonder in a questioning way, but in an appreciation way. In a, wow, that's amazing. I am astonished kind of a way. So, um, I think that to wonder means that you need to be intentional. Like you actually have to stop and be intentional, which means to do something on purpose or deliberately. So you could perhaps, I could perhaps sit by the campfire and the fireflies are there, but if I don't just actually intentionally look at them and, and wonder about, one, sit there in wonderment about them, um, yeah, it's easy to just, oh, yeah, okay, bugs, right? <laughs> bugs, yeah. If I stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, if I just don't take the time to actually take it in, and maybe it's because I'm getting older, but I find myself doing this more and more. Um, standing and taking time to appreciate something. And... I want to encourage you today to do the same. And you know, of course, I'm going to tie this into our faith. Of course, you know that's where I'm going with this this morning. Because I think that there are some things in our faith that we have lost our wonder. We have lost a spirit of wonderment that we take it for granted. And so I just want to go through a few points with you this morning I can only encourage you to take time to wonder at the many aspects of your faith and appreciate them. I was thinking, I texted my mother-in-law this morning and I, I just said, Happy Mother's Day. I love and appreciate you. And it hit me, there's, you can love something, but I think saying you appreciate it is taking it to another level. It's not just saying I love you, it's appreciation has a different quality to it, right? And so in our faith, we can say we love Jesus, but do we have a spirit of appreciation for him and what he's done for us? The Old Testament uses the word wonder a lot. In the New Testament, it usually is in reference to signs and wonders. But in the Old Testament, there, are, there is the word wonder and wonderful. And the biblical uh, definition of the word, word wonderful is something that calls forth wonder. I love that, to call forth wonder. So I just picked, there's many scriptures that talk and use the word wonder or wonderful or, you know, some kind of version of that. But the next slide, I chose three of just my favorites. <laughs> um, so, okay, they're up there. So Psalm 119, 
actually uses the word wonderful a lot, but in verse 18, it says, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instruction. It's talking about his word. His word is the instruction. So the psalmist is saying, open my eyes to see the wonderful. They call forth wonder. Do you, do you think of it that way? Do you think of the word and his instruction as something that you should wonder at, you should stand in rapt attention of? In verse 27, it says, help me understand the meaning of your commandments, and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. And lastly, Psalm 71, 17. Oh God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. So, do we? Do we consider his deeds wonderful? His instruction, things that will tell the next generation. Is that what the next generation's getting from you? That your faith is something that should call forth wonder? Or is it just religious duty? Is it religion? Is it just kind of lost its value in your life, your attention. So then I had to kind of ask myself, what are things that make us lose our wonder? And this is not a complete list. This is just things that I felt impressed upon my spirit that I know that I've struggled with. And perhaps you'll be able to relate this morning. And I call them forth because I'm, I'm very much a believer in calling things to the light. And when you call them to the light, they don't have the power over you anymore. So calling things to the light that have robbed your wonder, your appreciation for your faith, and for the man of Jesus Christ, we're going to do that this morning. So I think one thing is distractions. There's so many distractions in this world. And I think this last year, they've been maybe held at bay a little bit. But it's interesting, once distractions have been there, it's, I, I feel like it's just been easy for people, me included. You've just gotten into a routine. <laughs> but I was going to say, I don't know if you, how many have been to Niagara Falls? Oh, wow, a lot of you. That's more than have been to the Grand Canyon. Wow. So Niagara Falls is very touristy, right? I mean, there's like Ripley's Believe It or Not. There's like a strip with like the fudge shops and the, I don't know. There's every kind of touristy thing at Niagara Falls. And that's what I'm talking about, distractions, you know? They took this beautiful God-made uh, creation. <laughs> and because people wanted to come and see it, then you know, took a full advantage of that, and it's a very touristy area now. But those can be distractions. Like, as a kid, it's like, oh, yeah, the falls. Oh, let's go and uh, ride the roller coaster, you know, or whatever. I don't think there's a roller coaster there, but you get the point of what I'm trying to say. So distractions. But as Christians, we have so many distractions. And I can name mine, but I think for every individual, they're going to be different. But I think it's something important to take a little bit of inventory of in our lives. The second thing I thought of was worldly pleasures. It's just kind of our desire to feed our flesh instead of our spirit. It can uh, rob us from standing in awe of our God and an appreciation for our faith. Three, busyness. I remember when everything first shut down, hearing parents and people say, you know, Randy and I are out of that stage of life now, that it was kind of nice to not have to run kids here and there. <laughs> you know, there was no sports, there was school, uh, you know, and things just kind of quietened down. But they're starting to pick up again, you know, but busyness, and we, we, we all have the same size plate. It's called 24 hours in a day. And I thought, you know, I, I thought of like at Thanksgiving, 
we all get the same size plate. And I'll say to my husband, you know, he goes through the line and gets his food on his plate, like you probably all do. And I'll say, oh, but you didn't take any of my sweet potatoes that I made. I thought, I thought you liked those, honey. And he says, well, I mean, my plate's only so big. If I eat this and I have room, I'll go back and get your sweet potatoes, right? And I thought, that for me is a good visual of our 24 hours a day. Sometimes something's got to come off the plate. But going through the Thanksgiving buffet line, how do you fill your plate? You fill it, you prioritize. Like, I like turkey the best, so I'm going to make sure that's on my first helping, right? Whatever it is for you, it's going to be different. Just like in our 24 hours a day, whatever it is for you, it's going to be different than me. But, but when our plates get too full, we're concentrating on all that, and there's very little time for this, for faith, for the word, for worship, for Bible study, for prayer. Um, noise, just voices and opinions, Lord knows. It's been a year for that, yes? But how distracting from our faith. Just rushing. One of, my, one of my quotes I love, you know I love Ann Voskamp, and she says, hurry always empties the soul. Think about that. Rushing around, hurrying. And you know something you might say, but that's 2021. That's just life nowadays. But it doesn't have to be. You have a choice. Just like... He has a choice to not take my sweet potatoes on his first plate, right? We all have a choice. We can't blame the outside things for what we choose to do. We can quiet the busyness. And then lastly, I think desensitization. I think we become very desensitized. Just like that, that picture of the ultrasound, it's easy just to get desensitized by some of that stuff, and, and the meaning of that is just to be made less sensitive. And I think if anything needs sensitivity in our lives, it's our spirit. It's being in tune with the spirit. It's being in tune with the word and what God is saying to you. But, you know, you know, you, you see the news, you see whatever, and the violence, let's say, or murder, or, and we just, oh, just another day in 2021. We get so desensitized, and I really feel like Jesus is calling us back to be people of sensitivity, because you know what? Each one of those people is created in the image of God, and I'm not saying you have to fall and weep on the floor every time you see you know, some kind of violence. Or the people in India and the, the, just the footage we've been seeing, like each one of those people is created in the image of God. Don't become desensitized. And as that applies to our faith, how desensitized to this do we become? Eh, get my U version out get my devotional out, put my time in, but so decent, not sensitive to what it's actually saying. And not just what it's saying, but then in turn, what the Spirit is saying to you and calling you to and asking you to do. Maybe it's something really hard like, like you read this in the Word today and I'm asking you now to take this off your plate. Oh, but... I really like doing that. It really feeds my flesh. It really makes me feel good. It keeps, keeps my time busy. But Jesus wants us to be sensitive to him, especially in the day and age we live in. And I'm going to ask you this morning if you've been robbed of your wonder. Your wonder for things on this earth where you could maybe walk by a field of Sunflowers, just eh, weeds. 
instead of maybe just take a moment and think, wow, how great is our God that he created those. And I think some of us are more naturally inclined to be that way, I being one of them. Kind of a little sappy, kind of like to take the time, like poetry, right? And some of us perhaps are not that way. And so I ask you this morning in your lives, what has been robbing you from your wonder? And what in your life deserves appreciation? And so, again, I just made a short list. These are, these are and it's not complete, but I, I just wanted to say, I'm going to call out some things that deserve appreciation in our faith journey. And not appreciation like I'm walking by a Monet in a gallery and saying, wow, what a beautiful painting, and then moving on to the next thing. But I want it to be an appreciation where you stop and you ponder and you meditate in the sense of giving time to it, giving understanding to it. Scripturally, that's what meditate means. It's, it's to be, uh, have an understanding, a deep understanding. So number one, I have to say, something that we have lost appreciation for, perhaps, I think for some people they haven't, but it's this. It's coming to church. It's fellowship. I know that you can worship Jesus from home. I know that you can worship Jesus in your car. But Hebrews 10, 25 says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I'll tell you, there's nothing that replaces getting together in fellowship with one another. Amen? In the New Testament, they fellowshiped. They fellowshiped over food. They broke bread together. Jesus set that example. If it wasn't important he would have just gone off by himself or encouraged his di disciples to do so as well. And I just think <laughs> there's a country to the north of us. They haven't been allowed to do this for over a year. In fact, they just arrested a pastor for holding church. He's a street preacher, actually. He grew up in communist Poland, and now he just got arrested in Canada. Don't take this for granted. Don't lose your amazement at this. Don't lose the rapt attention, the astonishment that I can come to Bible study with my ladies on Tuesday night and they feel like family. Right, Joy? You're my sister. Yes, we pray for one another. We cry with one another, right? Don't lose your wonder. Number two, salvation. One of my favorite scriptures since I was first saved. Psalm 51, 12. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Have you lost the joy of your salvation? I love being around newly saved people. They have such a wonder at Christ and the person of Christ. And that... They were this, and he transformed them, and now they're this, right? Uh, number three, communion. Uh, talk about something we can be desensitized to. We do it once a month here, and, and it's usually a, always around that same scripture of the last, of, uh, that you read in 1 Corinthians, you know, about taking communion, and, and, it, and it says, you know, to examine yourself. Don't become desensitized to that. When that's said, don't, don't just uh, take that for granted. I think communion is something to wonder at, that Christ left that for us, that example for us, how we can examine ourselves. Forgiveness. The mar marvel of forgiveness. Our sins are as far as the east is from the west. That is something to marvel at. That is something to be in wonder of the word. Don't take this for granted. Uh, 
there's so that could be a message in itself, not losing your wonder over the word. As we've been reading through Second Peter and Bible study, it's amazing to us as we read and the things that Peter talked about are so um, applicable to what we're going through today. What else can you say was written that long ago that you can still apply to your life today? Just I sit in wonder of just that alone. And I encourage you to as well. Your testimony, grace, I mean, there's so many things. And, and for you, I encourage you this week maybe to take some time to think about those things and to really ask yourself, do, do I really appreciate this? Do I really appreciate this? Or has this just become dead to me, dead religion? Matthew 18, 1 to 4 says about that time so anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven when i think of wonder i do think of children they just see everything with wide eyes excitement christmas morning kind of wonder right and we lose it, and I thought, as parents and mothers, I guess, it's Mother's Day, we spend our time teaching our children how to become like us, when I think really we should be taking the lessons from them and becoming more like them, becoming more childlike. Do you notice that as adults, we become so just stiff and proper and I don't know if it comes with just maybe feeling like we don't want to be embarrassed and we don't want to do something that someone might laugh at us. But I just say, be free. Even in worship, become like a child. I, uh, uh, be as humble as this little child. They are the greatest in the kingdom, right? They just possess those certain qualities, and Jesus, Jesus points that out. So in closing, I'm going to turn to Luke. You can turn there with me if you'd like. Chapter 5. So the Gospel of Luke. Are you there? I hear pages turning. I'm still turning, so just bear with me. So Luke 5, I want to read it from my Bible. And I have my readers, too. So, gray hair readers, yay! <laughs> All right, we're going to start at verse 17. And just, can I just read this story to you? It's a few verses, but just let me read this to you, please. One day while Jesus was teaching... Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? <laughs> That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. I speak that over Helen today too. Yes. And immediately, as everyone watched the man, 
jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. You probably learned this in Sunday school, right? I think there's a little song. This is the best part <laughs> for today's message. <laughs> Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. I love that. I th there's several things in there to be amazed at. The forgiveness, the attention that Jesus had for this poor man, his care, his compassion, his healing power. And you know what? I know that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know he still does it today. I know he still heals today. Have you lost even the faith to believe he heals today? That he can touch our dear sister right there, wherever she is, and wherever you are at home, whatever it is that is binding you. Maybe it's fear. Fear is out of control right now. And I bind it in the name of Jesus. Fear is not from God. They were gripped with great wonder. Are you? Are you? Never lose your wonder. It, it brings such a deep appreciation for your faith and for the man of Jesus Christ who walked on this earth, who died on a cross, who forgave you of your sins, who was raised again, who transforms our lives. Your testimony is a powerful thing. Have you even lost your wonder of that, that you don't even share it anymore? That you don't share it with your children? That you don't tell your children of the wondrous deeds of our God? He is so deserving. He is so deserving. I pray this message lights a fire in you, lights a fire for your faith. It's all we have. Do you know that? When all is said and done, your homes, your boats, your summer homes, your winter homes, your, your stuff, it's going to burn. You will not take it with you. All I have, I can give to the next generation. And they in turn to the next generation as that, go to that very first slide, that Mother's Day slide, as Deuteronomy talks about, right? May they bind it on their hearts. May you bind it on your hearts. If I knew I was going to die tomorrow, this is what I would want to tell you. I would want to share this with you and encourage you to find your wonder again. If you've lost it, take time this week to pray and ask the Lord what distraction, if it's a distraction, what, what any of those things are that has robbed it, the desensitization, your pride, your self-sufficiency, whatever it is, it has taken that from you. God is able to restore it back unto you because he's got stuff for you to do. He wants you to make his kingdom known on this earth. And if you don't wonder at it, nobody else will.